Welcome back to the Holistic Health Bites podcast. Today, we are having a fun conversation with Kelly Miller, and she's going to tell us about nutrition as it relates to addiction and some of the things that go into recovering from addiction. So Kelly, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm a nutrition therapist and a recovery coach, and I've had a virtual practice for four or five years now, um, focusing primarily on nutrition therapy for recovery. Um, and when I say recovery, I mean recovery from most specifically, you know, substances of abuse, but also sometimes just sh sugar addiction, food addiction, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I see clients one-on-one. -on -one. I've been doing that for a long time. I uh, facilitate group work at local treatment centers in the Denver uh, metro area, um, but I'm getting ready to transition into a group coaching format. So um, I'm excited about that and what it'll allow me to provide access to. I love that. And that's going to be more of like a membership based, right? So mm -hmm. kind of lower cost, but ongoing. So people get lots of support in a group format. Yeah, absolutely. I've really struggled through the years of trying to figure out the price point for one-on-one -on -one sessions that would work for both my clients and myself. Um, and it's just so hard to meet everybody's needs. And so eventually I knew I'd probably move into the group coaching model um, and for that reason. And I'm just really excited about it because at the price point that we have, it'll pretty much be accessible to anyone and people will be able to really um, experience what I'm doing in my one-on-one -on -one sort of high price point sessions, um, in a, in a group way where if, if you're familiar with recovery and what that world looks like at all, you probably know that community is key. Um, and so that aspect, I'm really excited to be able to bring into the program as well. I love that. So tell us a little bit about kind of what you recommend for people, maybe if they're coming to you brand new, what kind of stuff would relate to recovering from addiction? I think a lot of people are probably like, what does nutrition have to do with this? So can you give us a little bit of background, how that really yeah. helps? This is my favorite thing to talk about. So, <laughs> you know, if you were a person with maybe type two diabetes or, um, cardiovascular disease or high blood pressure, and you went to your doctor and you said, you know, Hey doc, um, I, I, as you know, I have this problem. Is there some kind of diet I should be on or something I should be paying attention to? Um, and it's very likely that you, you might get a wide range of answers, but they may print out a piece of paper for you and say, well, here's kind of the best diet or the best couple diets that might work for whatever you have going on. Um, but if you went to the doctor and you said, Hey doc, you know, I'm, I'm in recovery. Um, I just gave up alcohol recently. I just came out of a treatment program. Should I be thinking about food and what I eat? And is this important? Um, um, you would get a vastly different answer from one person to the next, anything from, um, nope, doesn't matter <laughs> to, well, you know, just eat more vegetables or do a plant-based diet or try to cut back on your processed foods a little bit, um, or just don't eat too much. Um, or the one that I love the most is have all the sugar you want, because that is really what will help you with cravings. Uh, so, so you'll get so many answers and, and that has frustrated me over the years. And so one of my passions is just the education piece, not just for people in recovery, but also like mental health professionals and really anybody else that's going to have exposure to people that are experiencing recovery. So I created a framework, a dietary framework um, that I call the pause protocol pause P A W S stands for post acute withdrawal syndrome. Um, and the reason I created the protocol is for this exact reason. So that hopefully I can kind of get it into the hands of those who are working with these individuals to go, okay, this is not a diet, but it is a very simple dietary framework that directly addresses the issues that people in recovery have. The data is there. If you go to PubMed, if you read the studies, We've got tons of data to show what people in recovery are struggling with, what specific nutrient deficiencies that they will most likely have, what are the symptoms of pause and how that relates to the nutrition and the food that we put in our body. And also just the dietary patterns that are really common for people who struggle with addiction in some form or fashion. Um, and, and there are, but have been many wonderful pioneers that have come before me who have written these amazing books and have resources and sort of what I did was I just pulled it all together because nobody had kind of said, you know, here's a framework. It was all just kind of information here, information there. Um, and so that is what I use with my clients. You know, I, we do a dietary assessment, you know, where are you at? Cause you always got to figure out where that starting point is. 
Um, you know, we do a nutrition assessment. We do something called a neurotransmitter assessment where I get a really good um, symptoms-based reading of where their brain chemicals are at. And we can always kind of take a deeper dive on that if that's a, a topic that you think would be interesting to talk about. Um, and the, and so a lot of information gathering. And then that's that's where we start. We gather the data. I really get to know somebody. I have um, really progressed, I think, or transformed in my practice as a nutrition therapist over the years in terms of initially coming at it with sort of a consultant mindset. So somebody would come to me and it's like, here's my problem. And I would be like, I know how we're going to fix this. And here's the plan. Um, and I've really developed a lot of coaching skills over the last few years that is helping me to help my clients implement the changes that they need to make instead of just sort of like, here's the info, here's what we need to do. Um, so that's been a really fun part of being a nutrition therapist as well. It's just learning these new tools and um, learning how to help people make real sustainable change that's going to support their recovery and support their mental health. Oh, I love all that. It's amazing. So do you find when you've worked with all of these people across the years that you've been in this field, are there kind of like a handful of things that pretty universally people are either doing wrong or aren't doing that they should be doing? Are there kind of some standard things that really everybody just needs to stop doing or start doing? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it, it's honestly not much different than like the standard American person, right? Like the diet is usually consisting of a lot of packaged processed foods. Um, I would say kind of like the biggest hurdle is the misinformation that's out there, you know, especially in the recovery world. If you just Google what's the best diet or what should I be doing? Um, you know, as a person in recovery, again, kind of like that doctor situation, you're going to get so many different sources of information that are usually just like blog posts that somebody wrote in terms of like, here's what I did. And so now I am advocating that everybody in recovery do this, you know, um, the plant-based diet, uh, you know, vegan vegetarian is, is kind of a prime example of that. Um, although I believe that diet sort of has its place for the right person, I think it can be very destructive to a lot of people in recovery and it's often not what they need. Sometimes it might be what they need, but actually there's a much larger percentage of people that that's not a good fit for, and it can actually be damaging to their recovery. Um, so so there's that kind of a heavy reliance on packaged processed foods there. Uh, one of the things that popped into my head when you asked that question is fasting. Intermittent fasting is amazing. Like I used to run a fasting clinic and I think it's got wonderful therapeutic benefits for the right person. And if somebody in recovery wants to try fasting, I would highly recommend that um, they understand why they're doing it and it, it aligns with their goals, but to work with a professional that can help them do them do that. But that is kind of one of the things that drive me nuts is people will hear about fasting be, being so amazing. They'll come out of a treatment program and just dive right into it. Um, and so they're like, I just skip breakfast and I don't eat till two or whatever. But for somebody that's got massively dysregulated blood sugar, that is a very intense relapse risk. Fasting has to be approached in a very calculated way when you're working with somebody that could be, you know, at risk of relapse. And sometimes relapse is not that big of a deal in terms of it happens and people can pick themselves back up and move on, but sometimes it can be deadly, you know, depending on what the addiction is, especially if we're talking about opioids and fentanyl. Um, and so you got to be really careful about making those changes and knowing what you're getting yourself into and what to look for. Um, so, so yeah, Pro package processed foods, dietary patterns that don't make much sense. And I would say also the overarching theme is just massive amounts of, of malnutrition, you know, just so depleted. Um, which makes sense that when you're eating the most, huh? Yeah, it makes sense when you're eating packaged processed foods that you're fed, but you're actually malnourished. Yeah, totally. There's no but, and, and also like a lot of people who are coming out of intense alcoholism that like, I'll, I'll meet them, you know, at, at the detox center or whatever. And, um, they'll tell me they haven't eaten in weeks, you know, their body's been sort of tricked into relying on the energy from alcohol, which suppresses their appetite, but they're missing all those nutrients, um, the, the really important vitamins and minerals. And so, um, yeah, a lot, a, kind of a wide spectrum of things that you can, you can end up dealing with. Do you find anything with some of the other habits outside of nutrition? Um, do people 
there's probably a wide spectrum like there is in the rest of the population as well. That's not limited to addiction, but people are either not exercising at all, or they are kind of addicted to the high that they get from the exercise. And so they're overtraining. Do you see a lot of that? And then maybe even some of the other just lifestyle factors, do you see some commonality in what people are dealing with there as well? Yes, I see a lot of cognitive distortion um, that, and these are, there's kind of a handful that are really common for people in recovery. And again, like you said, like you'll see this throughout the population, but specifically in recovery, a lot of that rigid black and white thinking where somebody is all in or all out. And they will tell you like, if I'm not, you know, doing keto all day long and living the keto lifestyle and this or that, like, then I just totally blow it. And they're like face first into Baskin Robbins or something, you know? Um, so, so there's that there's sort of the black and white thinking, uh, there's, you know, areas of perfectionism. Um, I, I, I talk about perfectionism a lot with my clients and how it really is the enemy of progress. Um, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of beliefs that can interrupt progress, a lot of disordered eating type beliefs, a lot of things where people, you know, just yesterday I had a group and a a young lady was talking about how, when the, when the sensation of hunger comes in, her brain sort of clicks in and tells her not to eat, you know, Mm -hmm. she, she doesn't deserve it, or she just shouldn't do it, or maybe there's no time. Um, So there is kind of a wide range of that. And then also I would say like sleep patterns tend to be really, really off. Um, and, and some of this comes back to the cognitive distortion piece. So I personally believe like philosophically or whatever you want to call it, that there's, there is a pretty basic framework for like circadian rhythms, like when we're supposed to be up and when we're supposed to be going to bed. But I also believe that there's a little bit of wiggle room on the front end and the back end. And I think that sort of goes back to our primal beginnings when we were like, you know, tending the fire and, you know, being aware of predators at night and that sort of thing. Um, but some people will tell me, I'm not a morning person. I've never been a morning person. It's never going to happen, you know? Um, and I, I just love to try to help them switch that belief. I was that way for the, my entire life until I was in my mid thirties. And I decided I'm tired of this. I want to be a morning person. And I took really specific steps. And now I think it's literally impossible for me to ever break this habit. Like I am the most morningest person you'll ever meet. My family cannot stand it because it's like 6 a.m. and I'm I'm like bright eyed and bushy tailed and I'm full of dopamine and I'm like ready to go. Um and so there are kind of that belief, those beliefs around like I'm a night owl, I'm not a morning person, this or that, that I love to help people sort of shift and just have a growth mindset around like, what if you could be a morning person, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's not about me sort of pushing what I think they need on them or whatever, but I like to help reveal the hope that lies in changing your thoughts and your beliefs to allow you to experience just a completely different existence. No, I love that. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you made that transition yourself. Like what kinds of things did you implement to go from anti-morning to total morning? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I always had a lot of energy at night. I would get kind of that second wind that people talk about when they're a night owl. Um, and so I thought that was just sort of a natural rhythm for me. Um, I, I really believed that for years too, because for many years, um, like late teens, early twenties, I worked that shift, second shift, whatever you call it, where you would start work at five. I worked in the restaurant industry for a long time. So I, I always used to relate it back to that and be like, that's why I always get super pumped at like five or six o'clock. Cause I was used to that pattern of like, oh, this is when I start work. Um, and I would sleep in and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I just started looking, I, what I really did was use mindfulness. I started to really get in tune with what is happening with me in a body sensation sort of way in the evening hours. And what are my habits? So, you know, I eat dinner at this time. I start to feel sleepy at this time, but then I start to feel more energized. I'm turning lights on in the house. I'm looking for things to do. I find a show that I'm binging and I can't figure out how to stop it. You know, I'm exposing myself to all this blue light. Um, you know, I'm looking at the clock going, if I go to bed by this time, I can get up at this time and all that kind of stuff. And so I just started to, to get really in tune with what different things felt like in my body and what my actions were. And so started to slowly change that. So I was like, okay, if I used to go to bed at 1130 midnight or whatever, I'm going to try to move it up to 11 PM. Um, and I just slowly started doing that slowly started inching the clock up in the morning to make myself get up earlier 
And I started to notice some really crazy stuff that I never thought I would be able to notice before, which is I know exactly the moment that melatonin is released into my bloodstream at night. Wow. I can feel it. And it took me a long time to get to that place, but that was the first piece is I feel it. And then I need it. I immediately need to honor it. Right. Yeah. So in most cases, I'm actually already in my room getting ready for bed or I'm in bed. But if it happens to be a weird scheduled day and I'm downstairs, I'm like, that's the cue. I need to go upstairs. I need to have the lights off and I need to get involved in that bedtime routine because I'm sending a hormonal signal to my body saying, you are preparing me for bed. I'm going to honor that and, you know, follow suit. And when those things like have harmony and alignment, um, you can actually fall asleep, you know, it's pretty incredible. Um, and you know, and then the last thing I did, this happened during the pandemic. I said, I I've always noticed that I feel better when I get up at the same time every day. So I was like, I don't care what's going on in the weekends. I'm going to change my mindset that I need extra sleep or whatever. I'm going to get up at the same exact time every single day without fail, no matter what. And I've been doing that since early pandemic days and it's been life-changing for me. I mean, I feel so much more regulated and in, in tune. And I, like, I have a body clock that I like, you know, there's certain things that happen at certain times of the day that I can expect. And I know, and it, it does provide me with a bit of, um, I guess that feeling of, of safety and calmness, because I have become so well connected with my body that I know exactly what to expect from it. And I know exactly how to honor its needs, which is a huge thing that we work on in recovery, because when you're in active addiction, you are so disconnected from what your body needs. You don't know what hunger feels like thirst feels like when you're tired, when you are awake, you don't, um, you, you know, about, you might be suppressing bowel movements, you know, all kinds of things. So there's a huge like reconnection process that takes place. Um, you know, when we're taking somebody through the steps of, of nutrition therapy and lifestyle, I guess you'd say. Wow. That is amazing. I think it being able to get in touch with literally feeling your hormones like that is mm -hmm. tremendous. I think so many people could benefit from that. Just mm -hmm. that awareness of their body in general. Most of us are just kind of plodding through life and <laughs> we're actually completely unaware of what's going on totally. and how much impact we really have on it all. So I think that's amazing. And that was a yeah. great example of what's possible. Um, I would love to circle back to the neurotransmitter piece that you talked about earlier and a little bit about how you assess that, what does that look like? What does that ultimately get people? You know, what is the purpose in looking at all that? Yeah, totally. So, you know, there's a lot of kind of theories out there about, you know, like one that's been a hot topic lately is like the, the theory of serotonin and depression and chemical imbalance and that sort of thing. Um, and so there's a little bit of controversy around certain aspects of that, but what we do know, what is really pretty much been proven by this point is that there's four what we call neurotransmitters that are the mood regulating neurotransmitters. We've got over a hundred of these neurohormones that are kind of floating through our body at any given time, but these four mood regulating ones, which are serotonin, dopamine, GABA, and the endorphins are what really determine our mood for the whole day. Um, they're critical. And these are also the neurotransmitters that are affected by drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol cannot work in our body unless they specifically have a molecule that will attach to a receptor that we already have. Um, and that's how they are designed and that's how they function. And so, for instance, we make what's called endogenous endorphins, which is pain relief chemical, pain relief in terms of physical pain or emotional pain. The brain doesn't really understand the difference between those things. And so we make these endogenous endorphins, we have receptors for them. So if I break my leg in a car accident, my body will release some endorphins the receptor is activated and I can kind of feel that flood uh, of pain relief or numbness or whatever. So when somebody takes an opiate or an opioid of any kind, that molecule, although it's synthetic and man-made and that sort of thing also attached to their, to that receptor. And that's how we experience the different pleasurable effects of, of drugs and alcohol. Every drug and, and alcohol, and I have to throw food in there too, you know, ultra processed foods and sugar has sort of a different way of manipulating those four chemicals 
So some drugs, for instance, like cocaine or meth is considered a stimulant and really, really stimulates dopamine. Um, and something like ecstasy primarily will work on serotonin and you'll get a flood of serotonin. And that's why the effects are a little bit different. But what happens is, is if I were to break my leg in a car accident and my, my body and my brain released endorphins to help me cope with that, that's a natural process that my body understands. I was using endogenous opioids. My body doesn't have an overcorrection um, response to that. It goes, it goes, yep, we did exactly what we needed to do. The endorphins retract when the time comes. When we use a synthetic opiate, it creates sort of this flood that the brain and the body cannot handle. It's too much endorphins being released and triggered and the body has to counteract that in some way. So the way that it does that is it starts to shut down these really important receptors because the receptors are like, ah, there's too much. I don't know what to do. I'm going to go to sleep. Right. Um, and over time, more and more receptors go to sleep. The individual feels they need more and more of that substance to get that same desired effect until eventually they are just now taking that substance to get some sort of baseline and to feel normal. So that that's where the amino acid um, assessment chart comes in and the neurotransmitter assessment chart comes in. So when somebody enters into recovery and we've now removed this chemical or this you know synthetic substance, the person's brain receptors are sort of like, what is going on? You know, like we okay, it's been a week, it's been two weeks, it's been three weeks, I, I'm not sensing any alcohol, what are we supposed to do? And so the brain will just very slowly be like, let's just test out and see what happens. I'll open up a receptor, maybe two. You know, another month goes by, the brain starts to feel safer and safer and goes, seems like we can open up a few more receptors, you know, we'll open up a few more. Um, and, and that's where you get that cycle of post-acute withdrawal syndrome that I talked about, which is primarily depression, anxiety, insomnia, lethargy, brain fog, memory loss, low libido, all of these things. Um, you know, and, and the reason is, is because the, the brain changes that took place, which is why they call addiction a disease because the, the presence of those brain changes we can see on brain scans, um, you know, the reason that that took place is uh, what creates now a massive depletion in these chemicals. So for instance, if you've been using opiates for a long time, exogenously, not using your endogenous opiates, now your brain has gotten, or your body has gotten so used to not producing those and using its own that, and the substance is not there, you're super depleted. And when you're super depleted in endorphins, your emotional resilience is really low. You are physically and emotionally much more sensitive to pain than normally what you might cry very easily. Physical pain, like even acupuncture can feel super painful. Um, and so what they've found in the studies and in clinical research is that you can test somebody's neurotransmitters with things like urine. Um, and, you know, I use something called bioenergetic testing and there's blood tests and that sort of thing, but actually the most accurate way to test your neurotransmitters is through a symptoms-based analysis. So that's where the chart comes in. It's, it's a questionnaire. It was created by Julia Ross, who wrote the book, the mood cure. Um, which if you're in recovery or you love someone in recovery, highly recommend that book. Um, and that's what I, that's what I do with them. So like we go through the assessment, I sort of interpret it from them. And then what we do is put together a targeted amino acid protocol, which is, um, I'll just give you like the headline for that. And, you know, your, your listeners might have some understanding of that, but amino acids are what we get when protein is broken down. And those amino acids, really specific amino acids are the building blocks for making those neurotransmitters that I was talking about. So I tell people all the time, I'm like, you can't pull serotonin down from fluffy clouds in the sky. Like it, it does, there's no magic here. Like serotonin has to be produced by providing the body with really specific ingredients and it's amino acids, actually just one called tryptophan. Um, and so you can, you can work with people over time to really build that up from a dietary um, place by increasing their intake through food. But in early recovery, they can get such immediate benefit from supplementing that process with supplemental, you know, amino acids and capsules. And that's a very short thing that you do. You, you do it for a few weeks, a few months on occasion, maybe up to a year. Um, and then you just stop them when you're ready. There's no weaning. They're anti-addictive. It's literally impossible to get addictive to them because you're literally just taking components of food. Um, 
And so they can help you to get amazing progress, especially, especially in early recovery, when you're kind of working on all these different things and you just need that stabilization. So things like depression and anxiety and overwhelm just start to sort of melt away. Um, it's pretty remarkable. It's so fascinating that such simple things can make such a profound difference. Mm -hmm. You do have to have the right protocol. These aren't Mm -hmm. just things we should willy nilly. Well, I'll just add some tryptophan and I'll just add this other one. And you you really do want to make them specific and targeted, like you said, which is the benefit of using that symptom questionnaire. I love that. Yeah. Cause I have met people on occasion who'll tell me they've heard about amino acids somewhere and they'll be like, Oh, I tried it and it didn't work, but there's a very specific trialing process that somebody has to go through. Um, and a very specific sort of phases of dosages in order to find what the exact dosages that somebody needs, because somebody might need a little bit here and the next person might need a ton here. And you don't actually know until you've reached desired effectiveness, what that right dosage is for you. So I, I highly recommend not being kind of loosey goosey with it. Um, cause there are contraindications as well, but working with a certified protect pr- uh, practitioner that really understands amino acid therapy. Oh, it's so amazing. It's, I love how simple it is. And yet that you can go wrong with it if you just mm-hmm. guess at things. So I think totally. that's true in a lot of nutrition therapy and holistic lifestyle approaches is you might guess correctly, but you might also make things worse in the meantime. So it's always better to work with someone who really has that training. So I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah. You could de- definitely make things worse on accident with some yeah. of those. <laughs> Oh, so scary, but yeah, um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your membership that you're going to be launching and if you have dates or any specific details you can offer people. And then of course you can also share how people can check it out. Yeah, for sure. So my website for, since I began is called the addiction nutritionist.com. Um, that's just the landing page where everything will be. The uh, group format is going to be hosted on a platform that is called Mighty Networks, um, and the actual name of the group is Recovery U, like the letter U for Recovery University. Um, We don't have a live link just yet, uh, but it will be up on my website very soon, likely within the next week or two. Um, We're just tying up some loose ends and making sure that we've got all the pieces in place before we open enrollment to the public. Um, And so the best place to sort of get alerted about that would be to sign up for my newsletter on my website. If you go to the addiction nutritionist.com, you can, there's a free download there for my pause protocol, like a really cool infographic that um, somebody could snag. Um, and you can sign up for the newsletter. And as soon as we're like, okay, enrollment is open, we will notify people through the newsletter. I am not one of those like newslettery people. Um, we send very few newsletters, so you don't have to worry about me just like slamming your your inbox. Uh, we really only release a newsletter when there's something really important to announce um, and that sort of thing. So within the next couple of weeks, enrollment will be open. We'll have a wide variety um, of opportunities in that platform to join live group coaching sessions during the week um, where we will have sessions focused on implementing the pause protocol. We'll have sessions implemented on learning to manage blood sugar for relapse prevention. It really is designed to be a health and wellness platform for people in recovery, whether you're like right out of the gate, early recovery or long-term recovery. This is something I think has been missing from everywhere (laughs) for the longest time. There are, there's lots of alumni groups, you know, there's AA, um, there's all kinds of opportunities for people to have community and recovery. Um, and there's yeah, Phoenix, I think it's called is, which is like a gym for people in recovery. Um, and, and it's wonderful, but it, from my understanding, it's just like a gym where you can work out. This is virtual. So you can join from anywhere in the world and it's all the health and wellness stuff. Like we'll talk a lot about nutrition. We'll talk a lot about exercise, but also the mindset shifts that need to take place. Um, we'll have monthly challenges. We'll have monthly themes. And there is a seven part course in there as well. I really felt so motivated to release a course because as you know, when you kind of are working with people on the same stuff, you see the same things over and over and over again. And so it, can take me a while to get through that stuff with a one-on-one client. But in this way, it's like, okay, you can sign in, you immediately access the course. It's a high level overview. So you can get through it. Like you could do the whole thing in one day if you really wanted to, but that will give you like all the foundational knowledge you need to join the groups and start implementing this stuff right away. 
Um, so that. it's the, it's the thing I've been most excited about, I think, um, for the longest time in my business and in the next couple of weeks, we're releasing a podcast as well. We've got like 13 episodes recorded and really the, the pod, the purpose of the podcast is, is the same increasing access. I just want people to have the information. I want mental health therapists and addiction counselors to be able to listen and be like, oh, I can start doing some of this stuff with my clients, you know, or I could send them to recovery you to sort of fill that space um, of the health and wellness piece that maybe they're not getting in treatment and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I'm super excited about it. I love that. So that will be launching here probably early to mid April, 2023, yes. yep. if you're listening to this in the future. So then it probably will already be open if you're listening later. Yeah. Uh, I love that. And you gave the website. We will of course link that up in the show notes as well. So people can just click really easily. Um, anything else you'd like to share with the audience before we say the end of this episode? You know, I, because we're talking about addiction, I just like to make sure that people know, like, man, it doesn't matter like where you're at, where you've been, what's happened, the state of your health. There is so much hope. Um, and there is, there's so many very simple, practical things you can do, no matter what, you know, your stage of recovery is to feel better, to find your way out of depression and anxiety and insomnia. None of these things is a lifelong sentence. I have people tell me sometimes like, oh, I've had this problem for 30 years or whatever. That still doesn't deter me in believing that they can make progress because I see it all the time. I have so many clients that have told me they've struggled with something very specific. I have clients in their sixties, seventies and 80s. And they will tell me my whole life, I've had this symptom or felt this way. And after implementing this stuff, they feel like a completely different person. Um, and so I just like to let people know, don't let your brain convince you that there is not a solution out there for you. There absolutely is a solution. It's probably simpler than you think. And um, there's hope. There's always hope. Oh, I love that message. And I think that's true even outside of the addiction. I think that's true in every arena, there's always improvement that can be made. So definitely don't latch onto that identity mm -hmm. and believe that you have to continue living that way. I think that's a great message to end it on. Thank you so much for sharing all this information. I think it's, it's information people don't know. Like mm -hmm. you said, they're going to get all kinds of misinformation. They're going to get a million opinions with everyone they ask or every Google search they do. And it's really helpful to have it all in one place. So I hope everyone out there that has any level of addiction, even if you don't actually believe it's a full on addiction that you can't control, yep. this information can really help you get a hold of it and uh, turn it all around so that you can get your life back. I love it. So we'll link up all of Kelly's information in the show notes for anyone that wants to check it out and be sure to check it out and follow along starting April, 2023. Thank you so much. <laughs>